Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome all you cool ghouls and friendly fiends to the House of the Unusual podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pavlansky. With me, as always, are my good buddies, Eddie Guevara, Chuck Caputo, and Sherry Caputo. Everybody, what's up? Hey, hello, hello. How are you? How are you? All right, man. We got a lot of cool stuff to talk about today. Uh, we're going to dig into some UFO stuff and uh, a really cool movie. But first, I want to send everybody over to the house of the unusual.com. That is our flagship site. We have a free forum there that, that's great. A lot of cool articles and uh, pictures people are posting up there of their collection and, and different things. Uh, we also have a link for the podcast on there, which you could find this on just about every podcast platform. And when you do, please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a good review because that does help us with all these algorithms and all that. And we're trying to get out to as many people as possible. So that would be deeply appreciated. Also, if you want to watch some really cool videos, head over to our YouTube site, House of the Unusual. Just put that in the search. You'll see it pop right up, like our videos, subscribe to the channel, you know, all that good stuff on YouTube. So, hey, I don't want to get any more into these advertisements on that because we got a lot to talk about today. We're going to dig into some UFO stuff, uh, specifically the Kecksburg UFO incident. Oh, yeah. I also got a new movie for this week, too, that kind of ties in with all this UFO stuff. But, you know, what? I want to hear what you guys have been up to. Uh, you know, usually we started off with, chuck and sherry but today i'm gonna start it off with eddie because i know he's had a lot going on and so is chuck and sherry but you know we're gonna go with eddie today you know just to throw him on blast so eddie man what's up (laughs) everything's good man just a little tired they're trying to finish up the storage consolidate the thing and then come up with uh some new stuff there uh i was thinking about a whole new section called eddie's deep dives and uh, the only thing is, it's not going to have any water involved, you know? I was going to yeah. say, this where you're in the ocean and you're swimming around and you're, <laughs> you're videoing from underneath the, the ocean as sharks are chasing you around? <laughs> That'll be really cool. But uh, <laughs> I, I would like minus the sharks, you know? But um, anyway, so that, that's basically what I've been doing. I've been putting together as much as I could there. And also, the most important thing that we got to get done that uh, that's going to eventually happen is kind of like a revamp of the website and stuff. It's going to be made a little more intuitive. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, different things I want to add in there. So, yeah, a lot of stuff is going on with me. But that's about it, Joe. Go ahead. That was good. I know you're you're constantly working on that, uh, uh, your storage bins or your storage centers and all that. So I, I think we'd all really like to see some videos from that and, you know, open up some of those boxes that you haven't seen in yeah, that would a couple be cool. years, man. We want to see what's in there. Actually, that's that's the whole thing that's interesting about it. I'm I'm actually trying to um, to finish everything, uh, I, I, and that's the cost. Is it's I mean, I, I had four ten by tens and one fifteen by fifteen, and I'm trying to put everything into like three. So so far, I went down to uh, from five to four, and my goal now is to go from four to three. So I'm using all the airspace that I could in there because, I mean, it's pretty costly. But, yeah, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start opening every single item I have. I'm going to start uh, showing, and I will be selling a lot of the original stuff. I got to make space. Can't carry that to the grave, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to need to, we're gonna need to uh, maybe me and Chuck and Sherry, we'll build a pyramid for you. That way you could, <laughs> you could store all your stuff in there, and, and you know, we'll – We'll put you right in the center with all your stuff around you. So, hey, you can take it to the grave with you. Yeah, well, there you go. Tell you what, one, one of the greatest things that I have going, Joe, uh, just tell this one real quick, is a while back I was looking and, and I was reading about piracy. And everybody loves pirates, UFOs, you know, all this stuff that's fun. And when it, we talks to when we're talking about pirates and stuff, everybody loves the golden age of piracy, which happened up to the 1790s. Uh, I think once they killed Blackbeard, um, they took his head supposedly and they put it in front of the ship and stuff. And then apparently I hear that it's somewhere in uh, Massachusetts in uh, 
What's that place in Massachusetts where they have all the witches and stuff? Oh, Salem. Salem, Salem. yeah. They have yeah. Salem, Massachusetts. They have supposedly the skull in one of the museums. I thought it was in display for the public, but apparently it's not. But anyway, the point I was saying is the golden age of piracy ended with Blackbeard. Then they called it the Barbary Age of Piracy, which was later on. But the whole thing is, I was saying, I wonder what a flag looks like, a real flag. And I kept looking and looking and found out that really, in reality, we have no idea what the flags look like from the Golden Age of Piracy because they had this writings on it. But that's mostly speculation. We haven't really have, we don't have an, exa- an actual sample. So the samples we do have, one is we'll say in 1790, um, they're both in Finland, in the Royal Museum in an island on Finland. Um, you know, the one flag was caught by one of the generals, I believe. I forgot the name of the person right now. I'm just, you know, just giving a quick overview here. And um, he passed it on to his family, and it was caught in 1790, which was a red flag. And then I think in uh, about two or three years later, like 1798 or 1801, something like that, they caught a second flag. And the only two known flags in existence are in Finland. Now, in Florida, I took a picture about three years ago with one of them. And I thought it was, you know, it said one of the original flags. uh, And I thought it was, and I was all excited. But then I hear that the one in Florida is most likely not the real pirate flag. It's more like a World War I submarine, uh, Jolly Roger. And to, you know, so anyway, so I decided and I came across a person who does museum uh, pieces, uh, duplications from museums. And I was able to convince this guy, of course, for a huge cost. It's almost $1,000 a flag, but he did the flag on, a, I believe it was 180 year old. Um, not 180, 85 year old hemp fabric sailing cloth. And they he finished the number one that took him since May of this year. So it took him three months to get it identical to the original in size and everything. Oh, wow. They, they, I'm also working on the second one. Now, the thing with this is it's the first time it's ever been done. Like, no one's ever duplicated those original flags. So it's a one of a kind. The guy did say to me, Eddie, I charged you a thousand. I'm going to charge anybody after you at least 1500 or 2000 because it was the most uh, tedious work I've ever done. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm dying to get it. I got one already, but I'm getting it framed. I'm dying to get both of them and then put them on display and then show the people in the YouTube channel, Deep Dives. That's going to be one of the uh, featured uh, things that are going to come on. So that's about it, Joe. Sounds good, man. We can't wait to see it. So, Chuck yeah. Sherry, what's been new with you guys? Uh, I heard you guys had a real uh, cool uh, trip this last week. Yeah, it was it was great. We went to the Kecksburg, uh site where the uh, where the UFO supposedly landed. I think it was December 9th, 1965. Oh, you guys there? I think we lost somebody. Whoop, are you there? They can put it hear? on mute. It. Whoop, can you hear me? I'm here. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Am I okay? Yes. Joe. Is Joe there? Uh oh. Uh oh. You. Yeah. Uh oh. You. Yeah. Joe. Joe, just, <laughs> Joe just disappeared. So as he comes said, off. You know what it is. Here's what happens. The problem with Joe is, you know, he used to investigate UFOs. <laughs> when you mentioned the Kicksburg <laughs> incident, I think his um, he might have been abducted because they don't want him to be talking about any of that stuff. You Maybe, know. Yeah. He got beamed up. He got beamed up. Yeah. As soon yeah, as he comes so back, they, I'll just I'll just take it from. I think I'm back. Are you guys there? Oh, Joe, yeah. Joe, we thought you might have gone. Oh, the Kicksburg UFO came in and picked me oh, up. Yeah. That's what we were thinking, you know, because you used to be an investigator. So. <laughs> hey, I'll just I'll just take it from when you asked me what happened, uh, how did it go, then Eddie could. Yeah, because uh, I think we we kind of went there. Everybody went went silent for a while, and then. Then you guys popped on and couldn't hear me. I said, oh, what the heck is going on now? No, I, actually, I think the problem might be coming from you, Joe, because you disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just start like you just asked no, me. No, no, we're, we're good, Chuck. We're good. Did, did I have any missing time? Maybe I was uh, abducted and didn't realize it. Yeah, no, that's, that's good, Joe. Uh, we, I mean, that's good, Chuck. We'll let him uh, get abducted. It's yeah. once in a while. It's good. <laughs> All okay, right, go yeah. ahead, Chuck. Go ahead and start to, to where you guys were at. We're at Kecksburg because I know everybody out there wants to, to hear about it. I, I This festival is on my bucket list, so I definitely oh. want to hear a lot about it. 
I tell you what, you really have to go, Joe. It's fantastic. Uh, something crashed on December 9th, 1965. And uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, if you do go, set your GPS to the Kecksburg uh, Fire Hall, and you will not believe. I mean, it's it's really, really like in the middle of nowhere. But it was really cool. You know, I, I met the one and only Stan Gordon. You know, he's the, he's the legendary uh, paranormal investigator. He's a really cool guy. So I had a picture taken with him. And I had posted all this on the uh, forum. Uh, in 1990, the uh, TV show Unsolved Mysteries actually did a story on the Kecksburg incident, and they had built a uh, fiberglass craft, which is the same size, it's supposed to be the same size. I think it's about nine foot tall. Uh, so once they did their show, they asked the Kecksburg, you know, the, the uh, community, well, would you guys like this? And they said, yeah. So that's what they have up there now. It's, so it's a life-size uh, recreation. And so Sherry and I did a little video on it and so we'll send the uh, raw footage if you know what i think eddie will probably put it up sometime in the future but it was a lot of fun what did you think about it jerry yeah it was fun yeah and uh so yeah it's it's held each year for the you know for the community it's uh, by the fire hall and uh you know what it's like a nice it's a, they have a lot of vendors the, uh, the indoor vendors they have a lot of memorabilia uh people are writing books there's one, one book, book yeah there's one book i did buy and it's called haunted western pennsylvania and there's a lot of different stories in there of hauntings in, in throughout Pittsburgh and the Allegheny County. It was written by Patty Wilson. And it seems like a pretty cool book. I actually read about four or five stories in there. And so when I get a chance, I'll, I'll read some and more. she signed it for you. And she signed it. And, nice and, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there was a lot of outdoor vendors as well. You could eat. You could sit. And they have a parade. There's a parade that starts at 2 o'clock. They had aliens, um, aliens on the fire trucks. Um, throwing candy out for the kids <laughs> <laughs> alien candy can't get any yeah. better than that you know but it, you know what well, yeah i would highly recommend doing it you know it was very hot joe that day was yeah. about uh, 93 yeah, degrees yeah that was too hot oh yeah. man it was just it was it was scorching but it was a lot of fun that's the second time we've been there we went there a few years back uh pre-covid but uh right. Now, what what all do they have there? Do like I guess um take it there's vendors there, there's people signing books, but are there other type of events going on? Um, they do have like um there's a ta- all these different tables inside. They've got um Bigfoot people that uh like I don't know their names, but people that you know investigate or wrote books on um Bigfoot. Then there's the UFOs and what else? Oh, there's some other candles. Um, outside there's jewelry some wine uh some food trucks um so and there's games a couple little games that they have you can win and raffle tickets and things like that um it's it's a pretty decent festival it's 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 mostly vendors then yes indeed Uh uh-huh yeah you know like uh the the fire hall itself inside they have uh, quite a few vendors and they and you know what? People built a lot of really clever things. You, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of wood carvings and so forth. And uh, it's it, it's really cool, you know. And uh, it's, just, it's just a great way to spend like, you know, in like maybe a few hours in the afternoon. But like I said, it's difficult to find. Uh, right down the road, some guy was telling me that actually lives around there. There's a, a place, there's a road called Meteor, Meteor Lane. Uh-huh. And, and that's actually where the craft landed. And so within minutes, I mean, there was flatbeds that came down there. And they and they had put it on top of the flatbed and they covered it with a tarp and they just took it out of there. So I don't know what it was, if it was something from the military, if it was something from Russia they tracked, or I mean, who knows? You know, now, from, was, my, from my understanding, the exact spot where the the craft or, or whatever it was crashed is still unknown. Is that correct? I don't know. You know, it's supposed to be somewhere on that road, Meteor Road or Meteor Lane. This this one guy was telling me. Yeah, I mean, where exactly? I don't really know. Yeah. yeah, from what I from what I understand is that the general area is known, but the exact spot the is exact spot. unknown, or it has yeah. been lost, or whoever did know was sworn to secrecy. But I find the whole thing really, um, it, it's a very interesting. Um, sighting an event and i had the opportunity several years ago to meet stan gordon i've met him several times he's a he's a terrific guy and and i anybody out there that has a chance to ever go somewhere where stan is talking or selling his books i implore you to go and check him out meet him he's he's an extremely nice guy he'll answer any questions that you have his (laughs) books are fantastic i've read i think two or three of them he has a new one out that i i want to pick up 
and I'm hoping to see him this um Chuck, I think I sent you guys the link. I'm gonna try to pull it up real quick here because I want everybody out there if they have a chance to go. Uh, Mufon, Ohio is putting on their symposium. It's August 27th, and okay. let me get the um, let me get the place where it's at because I'm I'm not even sure where I know from when I kind of mapped it out. It's about two hours from where I'm at, and it's in Belleville, Ohio. And you guys can go to uh, MufonOhio.com. Okay, but Stan Gordon's talking there, and they have a few other guys which I've never heard of, but I. I, I'm going to try to go because I, I just want to hear Stan and I want to pick up his new book. He, he's fantastic. I mean, and, and if you read his book about the case files, right. the different case files he has in PA, there there's some of them that are downright scary. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, yeah. I couldn't believe some of the stuff. And it was you would think that you would hear, you know, if you're studying UFOs and Bigfoots and all that, I could guarantee you that. What Stan has to say in his books, you've never heard it in any other books. No, that's exactly true. You know what? And he's very honest about things. You know, he he looks, he searches for the facts behind it. You know, he just doesn't put his opinion in, in there. You know, he's a he's a great guy. You know, but uh, yeah, it was it was a really cool uh, festival. And yeah. They they had a lot of people there, a lot of um, people coming. Yeah. yeah, spectators, spectators, and yeah, they yeah. really bring them in. Yeah, so definitely, you know, we you know definitely check it out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is I did complete the little mechanical trapeze artist, which I posted on yeah. the um, Antonio. yeah, Antonio Diablo. I did, post it. yeah, he's he's a little he's a little Italian gymnast that uh, you know, mine's a, a recreation, of course, from Robert Houdin, who is known as the father of modern magic, and he had built the original about in about 1850. And uh, his was watch work, and they, uh, the original was 34 inches tall. Mine's 17 inches, so that's oh, how, wow. how that's how small I got everything down to. And you know what? Mine is state of the art. It's all electronic. You know, this thing is so complex, Joe, that I wasn't even sure if it was going to work. You know, <laughs> yeah, really? yeah. So, I, so I was really glad it all it all surpassed my expectations. So I so on the forum, I put the video and I put some pictures of it and everything. And you know what? I put I put the photos and a few videos also on different forums I belong to. And you know what? It's it it's been getting great uh, reviews. You know, I mean, like uh, fellow magicians have been saying, "Wow, a great job," and so forth. So. Yeah, so that was an experience, and so now it's time to do some stuff around the house. I've been neglecting things. I'm going to paint the front porch. I got some things to do here that I've been, you know, kind of putting off a little. You know, uh, that's called Son of Antonio. Yeah, Son of Antonio, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is that we did do our homework. We watched X, the man with the X-ray eyes, and we tuned into Ray Harryhausen, uh, some of the movies. I'll tell you what, Harryhausen is beyond cool. I mean, we yeah, were I was both, just going to ask you guys about that. Which which movies did you uh, end up watching? We ended up watching The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Oh, awesome. That was a cool one. And also The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. That oh, was with um, Carolyn Monroe. Yeah. And, yeah. And then we saw a special on Ray Harryhausen on exactly how he created these creatures. It was It was so unbelievable he and so tedious oh, oh my gosh jerry would you ever have the patience to do any of that oh my gosh no i don't even know how chuck did his antonio <laughs> diavolo but this <laughs> did you yeah can you imagine stop it was all stop action he uh, some sometimes he said it would take him uh uh one Days. day one day's work just to get 15 frames i mean that's amazing i, I yeah. couldn't i couldn't imagine the work that was put into that i've seen several specials on him and read uh, a book about his special effects and all that. And just having to do that, I, I there's no way. No. Oh no. no. It's, it's, it's time. Job. Yeah. And I do <laughs> remember. Put into it. Oh man. The you know what? You put into it. And, oh, yeah. and uh, back when I was a kid, I, I, I did see one of those movies at one point because the Cyclops brings back memories. I definitely remember uh, the Cyclops and the noises this thing made, like it screeched, and then the uh, and then the uh, Hydra with the se I think it's seven uh, snake heads. Uh, you know that was just unbelievable. I mean, wow. My favorite was the skeletons sword fight. Oh yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, oh, that's a classic. Yeah, yeah. Yep. and I did watch one movie that Cherry didn't watch when she went up to bed one night. I I put Jason and the Argonauts on, and I tell you what, that was cool too. Wow, I love that metallic 
uh, uh, statue that came to life and he was squealing and screeching when he moved. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and so Jason had noticed like a little plug by his by his heel and he put his spear in it and he and he uh, loosened the plug and, and all this viscous red fluid came out and steam and everything. It was unbelievable. What a concept. Hey, does anybody, does somebody out there, I'm getting a lot of feedback, like a, uh, an echo. Does anybody else hear that? Let me yeah, hear I hear it, Joe. I think, uh, are you having uh, any storms in your area? Uh, no. I, I think it's, you know, I, yeah, it, it, it's gone now. Oh, yeah, yeah whatever. Ever right. since we talked about the Catsburg, a lot of strange things happened. Yeah, we've been place. getting weird things. Hey, uh, I got a question before we even say, I know I'm, I'm going to mention the movie, but uh, where do you guys figure... Was it Ma D Dinkle, Matthew Dinkle, who came up with that acorn thing for the Ketzberg incident? Because, you know, when I read the whole story, the whole thing there, it doesn't mention. It says, in fact, that a lot of the things in there have inaccuracies as to what it really was. And uh, so many stories have come out from it. Who came up with the acorn uh, craft thing? Well, you know what? I'm not sure, but that's but that's what spectators said that that thing looked like once it crashed. You know, and it'd be difficult to talk to people nowadays because that happened in 1965. So that was what 50, 57 years ago. You know what? So the only people who'd be alive would be a few of the kids that saw it, but the older people that you know that that had seen this crash, you know, they're all dead. I'm sure. You know what? But there is speculation. Twenty years before that, Hitler was working on something called the Bell. Yeah, and, and so it was like a futuristic, like a like a time traveling machine, and they still have the cement foundations where this thing was tethered. It's in yeah. a, it's no, no, that, that is the belt. But I'm just wondering where did they put that, and how did that come into the Ketzberg thing? Yeah, I don't because, know. because you know with the stories you don't even hear the. They say it could have been a fireball. It could have been, um, you know, the metallic stuff. From I was just kind of wondering where that came. Yeah. Where they they stuck the story in. Uh, with with the that acorn thing, it, may, it might have been for the movie or the <laughs> what do you call movie. that thing? In search of you said was there? Uh that was unsolved mysteries. Unsolved mysteries. Unsolved yeah, that was such a now, cool show, wasn't it? That was a. It was for now. Show. Now, what I wanted to mention, and this hey, is Eddie, real real quick, the uh, the acorn thing came from uh, local residents that actually seen the object in in the sky. They had described it because I'm sure they didn't really know anything else on how to describe it, so they kind of looked at it to what it nearly or closely resembled, but there was a few residents that were talking to the news and even uh, unsolved mysteries that said that it did, that it looked like an acorn and it was yeah. the size of a Volkswagen. So that's where the acorn design. Oh, came. that's where it came. Okay. I was wondering, yeah. I'm like, okay, I read the incident, but it doesn't mention anything about that. Yeah, so they also said that the acorn thing at the, at the bottom of it, you know how the acorn kind of has that that little lip thing on the bottom. Yeah. There was a uh, hieroglyphic hieroglyphic type right. um, mm -hmm. yeah. writing on there. It's hieroglyphic, but it was hieroglyphic type. So again, mm -hmm. they were looking at this weird writing, and they were just making it, you know, resemble something that they that they knew would look like, you know, which mm -hmm. would be, you know, the hieroglyphics. But it doesn't mean it was that. It could have been. Uh, different symbols it could have been uh you know symbols that had you know dirt on it or um soot from smoke or or you know who knows what and it just made it look kind of weird looking but right. yeah that's how the um some of the residents initially reported the object to look like so yeah yeah oh, that, that, and the, that and the thing that sense. flipped me out and the thing that flipped me out joe is like you know i mean the you know what the the uh, military came with their flatbeds within like 10 minutes i mean it was like they were they were tracking this uh thing whatever it was yeah and you know and i looked years ago at the time there wasn't a military base anywhere near there i i want to say it was like an hour to two hours away at the closest military base right so they had to have been some way tracking it and i know there was um there's a lot of reports that people claim that it was a meteor that they were following or that it was a um, a secret spy. Wouldn't and this, you know, this one kind of makes a lot of sense to me that it was a secret spy satellite that had crashed. Uh, that was from our U United States government that was spying on uh, the Soviet Union at the time, right. and they knew that it was burning in, and so they were they were actually following its trajectory. Now that kind of makes a lot of sense to me, but. And, you know, the writing on the side, like I said, could be it, it could be anything. And people were seeing it move fast and they just said, oh, yeah, it looks like hieroglyphics. But it could have just been, um, you know, kind of like a pareidolia effect where they're just seeing, you know, 
what they think that they well, see. M- maybe it was uh, Bigfoot riding on it. You know, you never know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, Chuck, it all, you know, there is, or who, Eddie, whoever said it, there is that, um, you know, theory of the Nazi bell, the, the Glocka from the 40s that was a uh, experimental anti-gravity gravity machine. And some say they were experimenting with uh, the anti-gravity propulsion or that it could have been a... Um, yeah, like a time travel type Yeah, of like thing. a time traveling, uh, something to, that would either travel into time or open up a portal to travel into but, or backwards of time. Let me ask you a question. There's no scientific evidence. I mean, there is where the bell was, but the actual bell, the craft, the Nazis were working on, they never found it, did they? No, no, they never found it. No, they just have, like I said, out in uh, Poland, I believe, uh, there's the actual framework of the ground where where this thing was tethered because it would like it would it would fly away if they didn't chain it so it would be like bouncing up and down inside this framework and it's and it's still there it's like a cement circular type of thing right and there's there's really no hard evidence that the the bell ever existed there's a lot of uh people that said in interviews and you know and they're they're very credible people too there's a lot of ss uh officers and a lot of people that worked in that area and worked at that facility that did say yes this bell existed uh there is a guy i believe his name was witkowski or something like that from i think he was from poland who allegedly seen some uh, classified transcripts Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. the bell uh somewhere in the in the 90s but as for hard factual concrete evidence we don't have any but i think that these people that um that these witnesses when they've given their statement they they're very credible and there's no really reason to lie about it. So you say there is a bell, there isn't a bell. What, you know, what does it really make a difference? Mm -hmm. And all this, most of this stuff was even pre um, 1965. So it was pre Kecksburg. A lot of it, like the interviews and all that took place in in the late forties and all that. So, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You 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 take it for what it's worth, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You you do have a lot of mysteries there. And and you know, something is kind of funny because when, you know, Chuck Chuck started talking about it, Ray Harry house and, uh, (laughs) You know, one of the things I wanted to tell you guys, and, you know, the original Clash of the Titans, because everybody knows one of his best films is Clash of the Titans and, you know, Jason and the Argonauts and all that. But did any of you guys ever see the remake of Clash of the Titans where the guy says, release the Kraken? And, and yeah. it looks kind of like, a, I think they did it a little bit before they did Godzilla, because it looks a lot like Godzilla, like the facial features of the Kraken. <laughs> but uh, but it's it, that movie is phenomenal, man. The, I watch. I actually gotta say the, the the this is one of the best re-releases of any film I've ever seen. No, um, I did see the one. You know what? The first one from 1980, 1981. But I'd like to. I would definitely like to see the remake. That would be neat. It's it's phenomenal. But you know, I, I know we're going all over the place here from Ray Harryhausen to uh, UFOs. But um, we're talking both about films and stuff, but. You know what, Joe? That was probably one of the best uh, uh, things you told people to do to watch the uh, projects, you know, the Ray Harryhausen films, because he has phenomenal ones. And one of the things I got to find and show you guys is I have a giant 57 by 63 poster, if, I, if I'm correct on the size, the French poster, or 67 by 63, whatever it is. And it's the, the skeleton fighting with the wow. Jason, you know, the skeleton oh, wow. scene. That would it's, be cool. It is cool because the colors on that poster for being from the 60s, it's it's really amazing. It's really oh, good. That's neat. Well, since we're we're back on uh, Harryhausen and I'm going to kind of, uh, we're going to talk about a movie here real quick and we're going to kind of segue it back into the UFO subject because I got uh, a very important question to ask uh, all three of you guys and I want to hear your opinions on it i'll definitely give mine and it's something that um i've thought about in the past and i was really thinking about it when chuck sent me an email about uh kecksburg and i was talking to my sister-in-law who's going to uh the mothman festival in september at point pleasant uh but you know we're going to get into that here in a second and since we're on ray harryhausen right now we have our movie of the week for next week, well, for this week, and you know, we'll talk about it next week to see what you guys thought. And it's also uh, the special effects were done by Ray Harryhausen, and it is the 1950. Oh, I think it's 50. Yeah, 53 
or no, I'm sorry, 1956, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Oh, wow. Uh, I was written by Kurt Sidumak and directed by Fred F. Sears. And it was based on the 1953 book by Donald Keyhole, Earth, or I'm sorry, Flying Saucers from Outer Space. Uh, so if you guys have never seen this, it's uh, it's a definite classic. Ray Harryhausen special effects are great. Um I mean, there's some cool scenes of the flying saucers crashing into, you know, the U.S. Capitol and different. Oh. Um, you said it too early, Joe. I was going to tell you that was my favorite shot of that film. Oh, wasn't that fantastic? Yeah. You know, I actually have a model kit. It's about, I don't know, eight, ten inches tall where the saucer is crashing into the Capitol. That's phenomenal, man. It's- Chuck Jerry, have you guys seen this one? No. no, I haven't. So we'll look forward to it. We'll look forward. Oh to wow, this it. is a. I'm telling you, this is a a perfect movie. After you guys have just watched those those classic Harry Houses, this is a perfect uh, movie to watch, and it's great. It's all flying saucers invade the United States. It's it's really cool. And um, I tell you what, after you watch the movie, look up uh, Major Donald Keyhole, who wrote the original Flying Saucers from Outer Space. He is a very interesting person. And he he did a lot with UFOs. He was during the uh, NICAP era, which was the National Investigations mm-hmm. Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. So he's he's a definitely definitely interesting per person. He was a lot had to do with uh, Project uh, Blue Book and everything. So yeah. yeah, definitely check him out. He wrote a ton of books too. So yeah, yeah. And, and the the book I actually have that original book, Joe. I have one oh, of really copies. It's you know that the cover's nice in that book. Oh but- yeah. But I got to tell you, though, that movie, uh, even the beginning, the way the flying saucers come in, that's what I believe a flying saucer should look like. <laughs> I, I'm kind of stuck with that, you know. And that's one of the things that I actually have to Yeah, he, he really has a traditional look of a saucer. Yeah, right, right. But you know what? It got me kind of like, you know, that uh, Earth versus the flying saucer. This is this one is flying saucers. Um, what's the actual name? How is it again? Uh, uh, the book. No, 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 no. What's the name of the movie again? Earth versus the Flying Saucer. Yeah, Earth, yeah, Earth versus the Flying Saucer. But the other one that um, this island Earth. I'm sorry, I was confusing. This island Earth. The, the shape of that saucer there. I don't like it. It kind of looks like a like an egg that's fried, like a fried egg. Yeah. Um, I just didn't like. I mean, it when when you watch the movie, it's fine, but the Flying Saucer there was not as good as in this movie. The flying saucers in this movie are phenomenal. Yeah, it's definitely your traditional yeah. flying saucer and, and how you think it would look. So definitely check it out. That is our going to be our Crypto Classics movie of the week. And it's it, it ties in perfectly with Ray Harryhausen and the whole UFO subject. Yeah. You know, kind of when you're, when you're watching, and, and I tell you what, the movie still stands up to today. But when you're watching it, put yourself in the seat of a person in 1956 America. You have the Cold War going. Uh, Roswell was a few years behind that. You're in the atomic age. And just kind of put yourself in that whole setting. And, you know, there, there's no internet. There's no... Um, right. UFOs weren't a big subject in the, the realm of reality. It was everything was science fiction. So when you're watching this and you put yourself in there, in that seat of a 1956 American and you're seeing these objects decimate Washington, DC. It's, it's very frightening. It is. And, yeah. and you know, and you know something about it, Joe, I, I mean, that's the only thing is like when you're a little tired, you kind of kill the words and name of movies like I'm doing right now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> one thing I'm going to tell you is if I'm correct, when you, I just want to ask this question, uh, Roswell, two years after it happened, didn't it disappear from time until this guy Stanton brought it up in the 80s? Yeah, that's exactly so true. Maybe, Stanton, Fried, Stanton Friedman, he's the one that brought it out in 1979, I think. Right, Joe? Yeah, it was somewhere in there. I believe it was in the 70s. I, I'd have to look it up. But, yeah, he's the one that really brought mm-hmm. it out because, you know, it was just, you know, hot air balloon and that was that. And, you know, you're at a time when people trusted their government and, you know, believed everything they, they said. And Stanton Friedman, he was the one. And I, I like I said, I really have to look it up. Well, you know what? I'll let our listeners out there. They could look it up and see. But Stanton Friedman, yes, he was the one that really propelled it forward. Right, because I think he spoke with Jesse Marcel, the guy that was behind the incident. Yeah, right. well, then the, yeah. The, sometime in the late 70s, him and Jesse Marcel, they were the ones that, 
that, that put it forward. And then there was a guy in the um, in the 2000s. Um, let me see if I can find his name on here. Um, Don, it was Don something. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he really uh, dug in the investigation of Roswell. And let me find his. I'm gonna I'm gonna look up his name because I tell you what, he's. Uh, uh, let's see. He's a Don, friend. I, I I think I know who you're talking. Is about. Don Schmidt. Yeah, Don Schmidt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He did a lot of. He's he's written a lot of books. He's like Mr. Roswell UFO incident. He has really dug deep. He's done a lot of interviews with um, relatives of the original people that were there. And I heard him speak a few years ago at uh, Mufon U Ohio Mufon um, convention, and he was fantastic i picked up his new book at the time and i've listened to him a few times on like coast to coast and different podcasts he, he knows everything there is to know about roswell and he has his own ideas about it so i would implore anyone out there you know check out his books read up a little bit on him and see what he has to say about uh, roswell because right now you know he's the tip of the spear for the the ongoing investigation you know it's funny a lot of you guys uh do you guys remember art bell right he oh was, yeah, he, he, who started coast to coast? I used to listen to him a lot when I was young, you know. And it's funny how one single guy in in the was in Nevada, Arizona desert, whatever. Yeah, uh, somewhere out there. Yeah, he started some. I think as many as five radio stations. That I always looked up to him because uh, I used to want to do something like that. And that's before I even started the podcast with Joe. That I mentioned a story one time in the early nineties. I I always thought about doing a a radio thing and the different ways, but you always procrastinate to death and then you never do. <laughs> and then I always tell people, you want to start a podcast, call a friend like I did with Joe and then just record yourself. <laughs> yeah. He was, Art Bell was good. He was the, uh, he was kind of the forerunner for late night uh, talk radio on, on these subjects. So yeah, he was, he, he reminded me of Harvey. Remember the rest of the story? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> And now the rest of the story. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, but hey, since we're back on the UFOs, this is the question I want to ask you guys. I'm going to just tell me, Joe. Tell me. Uh -oh. I really want to hear your opinions because I go back and forth with this. So I want your guys' uh -oh. expert opinions. We're going to ask the monkeys. <laughs> like we always say, we're going to get our <laughs> panel of monkeys to, to figure it out. But, you know, we're talking about these UFO festivals. So you have, you know, Roswell always has a big UFO festival. And you look at it, it has all these... Um, you know, people dressed weird. You have people dressed as aliens, all this stuff. You know, you have the Kecksburg Festival. You have uh, the Mothman Festival. And it, it kind of seems when I'm looking at these festivals and I'm, you know, seeing pictures, watching videos and all that, I, sometimes I think that it it doesn't the credibility of studying the subject. <laughs> you know, and other times I think, well, you know, it, it's fun. People are having a good time. It's it's bringing awareness to the subject, but then other times, and I look back and I'm saying, well, you know, it's taken away from the credibility of studying this stuff, you know, the Mothman cryptids, UFOs and everything. When you see the stuff that's going on at these festivals, it, they're almost making like a, a joke out of it or right, right. hearted. So I kind of go back and forth. What, what do you guys think about it? What, We'll start off with the tag team of Chuck and Sherry. You guys just came from a festival. <laughs> no, I think you're right. No, I think you're right. Sometimes you get people get a little overboard. I mean, they they uh, dress like uh, you know eight foot grays, or they have tinfoil hats. Yeah, when you when you get to that point, it does kind of it, it does kind of hurt the credibility with it. No, I agree with you one hundred percent. What do you think, Sherry? <clears throat> well, I think they're having fun. And um, it also gives you an opportunity to meet like uh, Stan Gordon and, and all these different authors and, and different people that um, really put their heart and soul into writing some books and they're very knowledgeable. So that's another aspect of it too, to be close up and to be able to, you know, talk with them and ask them questions and everything. Yeah, that's definitely the, probably one of the better parts of these festivals is you do get to meet the authors there and see their books and everything. And it kind of seems like from the pictures you guys sent of uh, Kecksburg, that it was really kind of like a, um, a, a very calm festival. And it was more about kind of like the, the incident and, 
meeting some of the people than anything else. Is that how you guys kind of felt about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. There was no craziness to it. Yeah, it wasn't you know, like that Harry Potter that you did a walk around. Yeah, I did a I did a few magic uh, close up sessions years ago for at, at Barn at Barnes and Noble for, for the opening of Harry Potter's books. And oh man, those people, yeah, Woo. they were. They were really dressed up, you yeah. know. And oh I, yeah, so yeah. there were no, no people dressed up at. Uh, no, no, I don't think Carrie wasn't was. in her alien outfit. <laughs> no, there wasn't. Um, maybe some girls had those little an antennas on. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some they were selling T-shirts and things that was you know people wore them from um, years before you know so. Like we bought some and we don't even know where we put them. Yeah, we bought a few t-shirts and they're like fluorescent green and I can't I can't seem to find them. We bought them about uh, three years ago. Uh oh, uh oh. Yeah, they, yeah, they disappeared. You know, I don't know. You know, and I've I've gone to a few different MUFON conventions. One more more like symposiums where it's just you know all different talks all day and. Sometimes you even see people dressed up at, at these things, kind of making light of the subject. I mean, you could tell they're fans of UFOs and all that, but they're really making light of the subject. And when you go to these things, there's a lot of, and I think it, you know, I think it takes away from some of these authors and all that who put their heart and soul. Oh, I, into I agree. And this stuff, and then you see someone, like you said, dressed up as a ten foot alien with their stilts on, and they're yeah, you know. It, it kind of takes away from it for me. I I, yeah. I don't know. Yes, yeah, you know what? I want to get to the bottom of it. I mean, I mean, like when I hear like uh, you know a Peniston talk about the Rundlesham Force incident and stuff. Right. Like that, I mean, you know, I like to I like to hear the firsthand accounts. You know, one of the other ones that stick in my head, Joe, which I'm sure you're sure you know. Uh, I mean, I mean, which I'm sure you know um, you know about 1964 in Socorro, New Mexico. Lonnie Zamora, that was a very compelling story. I mean, this guy was a police officer. I was just going to say, was that the one with the uh, egg-shaped craft? Yeah, and he saw maybe three or four little little uh, green men, you know, yeah, they were like walking around the craft. He was so upset that he went to talk to his priest. He was a devout Catholic, and, uh, you know, so that really... That puts a lot of credibility to it, you know. Maybe, maybe like the, his donuts were bad. They were eating inside the car. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was hallucinating from eating bad donuts. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, at least with something. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, what's your take on I'm all just, this? I'm mean, just to say uh, two things about that, Joe, and and I have a, a pretty good, I think, answer for that question. Uh, but before I answer the question, I just realized the aliens are the best possible. I, I guess. Um, uh, sellers and, and of any of those shows because they sell you t-shirts that you buy and you take home and then they disintegrate and bring it back to themselves. Like, <laughs> yeah, really? That's, what it sounds that's like. probably what happened. Yeah, I, can't, I can't find them. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's phenomenal. This way they, they don't have to make an unlimited I mean, these supply. things stood out, too. They're fluorescent well, green, I think, weren't yeah. they? That's ridiculous. Here, I can't find them. Here's the question. Let's Let, let me answer it, I think, in, in two parts, Joe, and, and I think maybe you might agree, but I, I think I, it'll, it'll hit the heart of your question to answer it, I think, for years to come. One is when you see an incident happen, whatever it is, a crime incident or a, an exciting that we went to space incident or whatever, we watch it and it gets exciting because you want to hear what really happened and it becomes the talk of the town. And, you know, the seriousness and you want to hear what really is. And, okay, that's fine. But as, as humans, we tend to forget over time. Now, when they start doing these festivals years after years, yes, it does take away a slight bit from the credibility. But at the same time, when you have collectors like me that go there, mm -hmm. I don't really go there mostly to hear about what exactly really happened. I usually go there to buy books about what really happened and to spend time buying junk and having fun. Yeah. You, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So what keeps it alive in my heart is the fact that each year they do the stupid festivals yeah. and, and, you know, it goes on. And a good example is every state, every county, including my buddy Jim and, and that I told you the story of the, of the guy with a brown derby hat or the ghost, they say, that walks the woods or lived in the house he had. Um, that lends to stories. But, you know, he told me about about it a while back, and then it doesn't get mentioned again, and it kind of gets forgotten with time. Like even the story of Robert the doll that the Chuck wants to go over to um, what is that place, Key West, to see. All those stories are phenomenal, but if you don't have like a yearly show with it and stuff, it gets over time and it, you know gets forgotten. Now with Roswell, with the Kecksburg, 
by constantly having this yearly thing, people are looking forward to going there. And it, it's kind of like fun. It's like the Renaissance Festival that's been yeah. running for years. <laughs> so, yeah, does it take away from the credibility? Maybe, but I think it's needed to keep the memory alive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also needed to keep it fun. Because if it's all about what exactly happened, how many times can you hear that? You know, it, it'll it'll fade away with time. So I think that those things are needed, even though it takes away from a lot of the because I go there. And let me be honest. Joe, a good example. When I went to the Coral Castle and half of the people in Florida haven't even heard of Coral Castle. Uh, the only thing that kept Coral Castle that it appeared in a couple of, um, you know, TV shows and stuff. And it's been written in books, but. The, the point is that people that lived there for 20, 30 years haven't heard of it and they don't even bother going there. Yeah, that's amazing. And, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. So if it had a yearly thing like Roswell, who hasn't heard of Roswell? Almost right. every co- state in the country. And, and I mean, just when the guy said, let's storm uh, Area 51, remember, two million some odd people signed up. Oh, yeah. So it brings, and there's more of an uh, influx of money into the area. It's also, it's good for the tourism. And I think, so you need them, even though they kind of, dis- but you know what? I, I got to be honest, Joe, before you ask me that question, I never re- realized that it discredited it. Even though it, I, I just don't think I looked at it that way. I looked at it as some people going there to have fun. And I also looked at it as a serious of what really happened there, but it's somehow keeping the memory alive. Does that answer your question better? Yeah, you know, I think you bring up a, a good point that, you know, we as humans, we, we tend to forget things. And by having these festivals, they're able to live on through the years and maybe even bring in younger generations. Right. right. Of, uh, people that are interested in it. But I, at the same time, you know, I, I hope that it doesn't take away the credibility. I hope that these newer generations don't look at it as just a festival and, and a joke and do find that there is some serious research into it and it's worth looking into. And, you know, every one of these events, you look at Roswell, you look at Kecksburg, uh, you look at the Mothman Festival, everybody's, you talk to a hundred people, you're going to get a hundred different opinions on it. And everyone's going to have a hundred different facts and a hundred different reasons why it is this and not this. But, you know, it's the fact that we can still talk about it and that we could still do some serious research into it. I hope we don't lose that. And at the same time, I hope we don't lose these festivals because they are fun. It's a good way to to meet the authors of these books. Because, I mean, honestly, how else would you really meet some of these people if it's not for the festivals? And they do have great research. Like Stan Gordon, he's has sixty over 60 years in this, and he does it full time. He's put his heart and soul into it. His, he's a very credible uh, researcher and investigator. And if he wasn't there, how else would you really see him? You know, it would it would really exactly. be kind of tough for some people. And, so, it, Go I ahead. Gonna, no, I was going to say, and Joe, when you mentioned the Mothman. Now, here's the thing with the Mothman Festival. I do want to go to Mothman Festival. Yeah, I, you know what? <laughs> I, heard, <laughs> I heard of the Mothman a while. But you know what? It, because it didn't really stick in, like I said, people forget. I kind of forgot what got me interested in the Mothman is one day I'm looking at, um, I was thinking, you know, like Joe, when we were talking about earlier, about two years ago, when we started uh, this show or three years ago, uh, we started this podcast. Uh, we were talking about unboxings and this and that. And, and then all of a sudden Chuck started doing an unboxing and Dr. Saab started doing an unboxing and you did. And it started becoming a little popular with us. And one of the things that I did was I was watching a thing on YouTube on, how to start an unboxing. And I came across a guy who was unboxing a Mothman box. I think the name of the company that was sending out the box was um, Primitive. Some I, I forgot what it was, so Expedition. It, it was a monthly subscription box that you paid, like I think it was $27 to $37 for. And when the guy started opening, he took out all this stuff about the Mothman. And what did I do? I wound up going on Amazon and buying every single book that came in there um, because it got me excited. When I got the actual books and looked through it, I was like, wow, man, here is a a thing that apparently they were doing some um, army paratroopers or marine paratroopers with the night vision goggles. Some people in a camp look at this and all of a sudden the Mothman emerges. It becomes a, a thing with wings and... You know, and, and, and it became a, a legend that is still thriving till today, you know. 
but that's the whole idea. Um, if it, the festival keeps it alive, and unlike like the Jersey Devil doesn't really have a festival, the the you know Sasquatch doesn't, you know what I'm saying? The Bigfoot and the Mothman and the Loch Ness are all kept alive because I guess of this yearly festivals, which you know it kind of makes it fun. And, and, and I love to hear about it and go to those things. You know, the first thing I asked Chuck when he was going is, I wasn't asking who are you meeting or what? Are there any good souvenirs there? Let me know. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. You know, when I when I looked, there was not far from me, there is a Bigfoot festival that comes around every year. And there's these big researchers that got go there and everything. And I was, I was actually thinking about going just to check it out. And when I was looking at some videos and photos of it, it almost just seemed like a, a big joke. And I said, you know, well, there's supposed to be this, you know, world renowned researcher there. And there's these people that have done all this research and wrote books and everything. And then you look at the festival and it all looks like, <laughs> like a, kind of like a big party. I mean, yeah, okay, cool. It looks like it might be fun to go there and, and party and, you know, Bigfoot and all that. But then, you know, it kind of takes away from the credibility of the, the study of it. it you know, you know I, I go back and forth. I'm, I'm very, you, you know what, Joe, the, the subject, but Joe, here's something you touch right now. You touch his cord. I, I'm just got to tell you this part of that. When you look at all the other things, the Mothman, you look at the uh, Kecksburg and, and Roswell, they have one location. What I think's happened with Bigfoot is. Oh, it's everywhere. They, it's everywhere. So they're, yeah. they're just making money out of, out of nonsense, everything. exactly. That's what that's what it, it seems like. It is a money making event. Yeah, right. And that's where it loses its credibility. And that's what made me. And let me tell you, Joe. You, I, I don't know if you ever been up to Lake George, but when I've gone up there with Dave, that we've gone for business and stuff. I got to tell you something. Every little shop there, all they do is sell Yeti stuff, and <laughs> oh, yeah, it's everywhere. You, you know, so that, that's the problem with that. It's yeah. fun. Even Walt Disney, there's a whole thing called the Yeti. Right. They have like a little shop and they sell all these amazing things of the Yeti, which is another name for Bigfoot, you know? But yeah. I tell you what, Eddie, that you brought up a great point because it's, it's a huge problem in the UFO, cryptid, uh, paranormal conspiracy realm of these people that come in that just they're just looking to make money. Exactly. And I've seen I've seen it more and more and I've started to become more open to a lot of these people. And you can right. tell within 10 minutes of talking to them. And I. I actually seen that when I went to the um, PA MUFON conference. I ended up leaving there, you know, halfway through it because some of these people talking, it's like they're just here just because they're getting paid too, and they're pushing this book that is just yeah. nonsense, and their their research is horrible. You could tell that they're either lying or being untrue, right. or telling half, half truth or all of the above. And I've I got really tired of it, and I left. And I immediately came home and I looked at um, MUFON Ohio's lineup and I seen state, you know, I've been to some past MUFON Ohio ones and they've all been great. Some of these ones on, on this one. So I really got to do some digging into it to see if I want to go. The only reason I right now that I want to go is to see, see uh, Stan Gordon and pick up yeah. his new book. Yeah. I want to get into these other guys because I don't want to sit through them. And they're pushing a bunch of nonsense on me because they want me to buy their book. No, I agree. No, I agree with you. Hey, you hey, know, I got a sense of humor just as good as anybody, but there's, yeah. a, seri there's a serious side too, you know. There, right. there is, but you know what, Joe? That's what keeps, and, and this is important. When you go to Roswell, for example. You know, you I, I'm all for, I want a t-shirt of Giorgio Succolo saying, you know, <laughs> uh, it's aliens. Yeah, I, I do have a sense of humor about it. But like you said, you know, you do want to have some of that uh, seriousness in it. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you go to... What happens when you go, Joe, to uh, Roswell? There's a museum with actual artifacts and stuff and newspaper printings from the area that gives it more of a seriousness. Right. And at the same time, people having fun. But I think all these festivals of Bigfoot, see, those are the ones that you are probably thinking about. They take away from the reality, take yeah. away from the stuff and make it a joke. It's a big joke. Yeah, it really is. Hey, you know what? You know, we have Punxsutawney Phil out here every, oh, every yeah. year. And and so we actually went there one year about, what, seven years ago, Sherry? Oh, and you know what? I mean, man, it's just like a big party. I mean, geez, everybody's out there dancing, freezing their, you know, kahunis off out there. And, you know, I mean, I mean, like, it is a fun thing. I understand that, it, it, you know, there's a lot of tradition. I went one time and I was so cold. I don't think I'd ever go back. I mean, it was 
it was like maybe what 10 degrees and the wind chill was blowing i mean it was whew. now chuck is this true because i would love to see punks of tawny but i heard you have to park pretty far away and then you get busted yeah. in the area then bust out right right what you do is you park at the walmart okay and you have to get there about 3 34 in the morning okay oh, what yeah. Yeah, and there's uh, school buses that you know what they'll they'll uh, shuttle you sh they'll shuttle you up to up to what they call Gobbler's Knob, and uh, you know what it was, you know uh, it was an experience. Yeah, Sherry, what did you want to say? I was going to say, wasn't it about four thirty or so? Yeah, about four o'clock. Yeah. And then um, I don't know the disc jockey's name. They were up on the stage in t-shirts. I don't know how <laughs> they did not get pneumonia. <laughs> they had it. They kept us going, thank God. But I'm telling you, it didn't start till like. What seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning? Yeah, something like that. You know oh. what? By the time they pulled that groundhog out, I wasn't feeling good. I said, I don't know. <laughs> I think he was biting them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he uh, snipped at their fingers. I don't blame them. Yeah, yeah I don't blame them. Yeah, how many people would you say? There's a oh. few thousand that go there, isn't there? That's there. I don't know thousands, and I'm thankful we did go early because we got a decent place to stand. stand yeah. But otherwise, I mean, uh, it, it you know was, where I, you know, where I would stand if I went to somewhere like that. Where? Next to the Porta John, because I couldn't imagine being trapped <laughs> in the middle. Yeah, and then you gotta take a leak or something. You're like, yeah. oh my God, what am I gonna do? Joe, <laughs> it was so, it was so cold, Joe. That was the coldest I think I've ever been in my life. I mean, you know, Didn't you know what? Those yeah, out, the, yeah, they had cannons where they shoot T-shirts yeah, out, play music, playing loud music. I think it's good to go if you're younger. To be honest with you, you know, this is about seven years ago, so I was in my early fifties. But you know, it's very cold. What one question I ask myself all the time, especially in New Year's: How the hell do people go to the bathroom when you have two million people? Yeah. That's what I already have too. Wow, you're, you're dead right in the middle of it. You're you're not you. I tell you what, that urge comes on. You're not moving. I, yeah. You better, you know, go right there. Yeah, yeah. So they do. There, there are shuttles to take you there. You know what? It's it's. You know what? It's a very neat thing to do. You know what? And it's uh, they, they they do have it all under all under control. Really cool. You know, the shuttles take you there. So once we left, we just went straight to like a diner somewhere to get a hot bowl of soup. Uh, it was like. Something. I mean, we were freezing. we were freezing. Absolutely freezing. Hey, I, I have a, an annual show we can do, Joe. House of the Unusuals, House of Mystery. Come from all over the country and see the collection. Hey, there, there you go. go. And then when they get there, they pay the money. You open up the uh, the door for the thing real quick. Say, there it is. And then you close it. Next. <laughs> there you go. That's an old, it's almost like, a, what, what do they call those? A, a tourist trap. Yeah, that's an old yeah. PT, PT Barnum trick to the yeah. uh, yeah, you to know, the I, I egress. Still, no, but you know, when we talk about all this stuff, I still can't believe that a couple of guys, a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2008, because that's when I wrote my first Go Ship Times uh, newsletter thing, the one that you guys have. Yeah. Uh, they came out and they said they had caught a live Bigfoot. And this guy's actually made it to television. Like, I was shocked that even in today's modern day, somebody will fall sucker for that and, and put it all over television, for, you know. Yeah. And and then it was a stuffed dummy. Like, come on, they could have asked for evidence before they put it on television. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Hey, the one thing I do look forward to doing, like uh, I think uh, he just mentioned this, uh, we're going to go to Key West, God willing, coming up in a couple months, and I want to yeah. I want to see uh, Robert the Doll. That would be cool, you know. If you want to check out a cool story, search it online. Robert the Doll. They got the original one at the East Fort Metello uh, Museum. Steal it. Steal it. Bring it to the show. <laughs> ah. Yeah, so I'd like to do like a little video, you know, if it's at all possible, and oh, it'll be really cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, there's a good uh, researcher who does a lot with uh, Robert the Doll. I, I can't remember his name. I actually haven't really heard anything about him uh, too much. I'm trying to look for his name real quick. Uh, That's they don't have an annual uh, thing like they do in Roswell. Otherwise, you would hear of it. You know? No, they should. They really should. Uh, oh shoot! I can't find it. Watch! I'll, I'll, as soon as we're done, I'll I'll be able to find yeah, it. Yeah. You know, and we tried about... and we tried to book a hotel at the place where the guy actually had this happen. It was at the artist house down in Key West. And how much was it a night, Jerry? It was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, oh, and it was booked. And it was booked for years. Yeah, it was booked for years, and it was a lot. Like I think it was a thousand dollars a night. No, not that. Much. Oh wow! It, 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 was, like, it, it was pretty. It was pretty high. It was yeah. pretty high. I, I, I wonder if they're ever going to pay for our beds uh, in our room when we leave. You know. <laughs> hey guys, yeah. we got we got less than a minute here, so we're gonna have to wrap it up. Maybe next week we'll continue on with our our talk of the paranormal and cryptids, but we got to end it for this week. That was a great conversation. Yeah. 
Um, make sure everybody out there checks out that Kexburg incident. Read a lot more into it. it it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, like I said at the beginning, make sure you check us out at House of the Unusual dot com on your whatever podcast you listen to us on. Please give us a good review and subscribe to our channel. We put out a podcast every week. Eddie and Chuck are constantly putting out videos on the YouTube channel, so definitely check them out. Chuck has a video from Kexburg on the uh, Sherry Caputo site, so definitely check that out. It's an awesome, awesome video. He has a cool magic trick in that. So that's all we got for this week. So everybody, thank you once again for tuning in. Eddie, Chuck, Sherry, thank you guys so much, and good night. All right, good night. God bless. God bless. Bye. Thanks. Bye.